Please kneel for our prayer for vocations. <clears throat> Let us ask God to give worthy priests, brothers and sisters to his holy church. O God, we earnestly beseech thee to bless this diocese with many priests, brothers and sisters who will love thee with their whole strength and gladly spend their entire lives to serve thy church and to make thee known and loved. Bless our families, bless our children. Mary, Queen of the Clergy, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Reverend Father, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm very pleased to have Father Ermitinger here today to act as our deacon so that we can have a solemn Mass. It's a lovely thing to do in honor of the great Michael. And we also uh, greet our own Michael and all the Michaels here on their name day. Michael the Archangel is one of the great, great figures of Scripture and will play, has already played and will play a magnificent key role in the history of salvation. It's good that we, from time to time, review something about our angels. Angels are magnificent creatures, and they are given to help us by God through life as guides and as protectors and as prompters and so forth. But what are angels? Well, there are different kinds of persons. There are uncreated persons, and there are created persons. The uncreated persons, of course, are the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Among the created persons, there are two kinds. There are those who have bodies and those who don't. Souls for human beings are created immediately by God, and then they inform matter, which is our body. We are body and soul. We are matter and form. And the soul is the form of the matter, which is our body. And so our souls are individuated in matter, so that we are this body and this body and this body with soul, body and soul together. That's what it is to be a human being, body and soul together, which is why the separation of the one from the other results in our death. And then they will be, of course, put back together by God, so that once again soul informs matter at the resurrection of the flesh. But there are also other souls who don't have bodies. And these souls are not individuated in matter like we are. So because we are individuated in matter, we all belong to the same species of human being. Each one of us is different from the other, but we all belong to the same identifiable species whether we are tall or short, or this color or that color, or this sex or that sex, we all belong to the same human species. But because these other souls, created persons, angels, are not individuated in matter, each one of them is their own species, as different from each other, as a ring-tailed ape is from a giraffe. They're completely different from each other. Every angel is his own species. We belong to one species. Each angel is his own species. And because of this, because they're all each their own species, there's a hierarchy among them. Each angel has his own place. You know, great theologians, for example, uh, Thomas Aquinas, working with another theologian by the name of Pseudo Dionysius, has they have partic they have uh, um, helped us to understand how God created triad a triad of triads. 
three sets of three of the hierarchy of angels. Sometimes we call them ranks or orders. Sometimes we call them choirs of angels. And of the first and the highest, and this is, of course, in a hierarchy, going from the top to the bottom. We have the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. And then in the next triad, we have the dominions, virtues, and powers. And then in the next triad, we have the principalities and archangels and angels. And even within those choirs is a hierarchy, no two angels being alike. Now these pure souls are, they transcend the material cosmos. We, as part of the material cosmos, are limited by certain aspects of materiality. For example, when we learn things, we have to learn it through our senses. We see things, we smell things, we touch things, we hear things, and we take the data points from all those things and we put them together in a process that theologians call dividing and composing. This thing is like that thing, this thing is not like that thing, therefore this thing is like that and that and that. And This happens very, very fast in our minds. And over time then we learn and remember things and constantly comparing and constantly saying this is like that and this isn't like that. And we, this is how we learn. It's called dividing and composing. But everything comes in through our senses. Angels don't have senses. So how would they learn something? How would they know something? Well, they know things immediately in the essence of the thing itself. They don't have to learn about it. They just simply understand it. Now, they see what we do. They don't know what we are going to do. or They can make pretty good guesses because they watch us for our, our entire lives. But they don't know exactly what we're going to do, so in that sense they, they can learn. But otherwise, when it comes up to seeing a thing or this or that or the other thing, they understand things in the essences themselves. They transcend the material cosmos in a couple of different ways. They are of a higher order. They are, we are of the natural order with supernatural souls. But angels are of that supernatural order in a way that we are not. And so that even the least of the angels, even the one at the very bottom of the hierarchy of the lowest choir of the angels, still transcends the material cosmos. And so today we celebrate a mere archangel, belongs to that second from the bottom rank, but God's might and God's plan are such that Michael is the one who restrained Satan, the highest in the hierarchy of the angelic orders, the mightiest of all the angels before his fall. Michael, it will be, who chains the great red dragon of Revelation 12. As the Lord says, even in the gospel that we have today, angels see the face of God. Therefore, they know God's will. This is a way of saying that they know God's will. They see the face of God. In another place in the Old Testament, Tobit. Tobit has the archangel Raphael saying that he takes Tobit's prayers and he puts them in the sight of God. Seeing the face of God is to know with perfect knowledge and perfect submission what God's will is. So complete is the submission of the holy angels that in Scripture it's often hard to tell who it is that's acting. Do you remember the, the, the moment of Moses coming to the burning bush in the book of Exodus? I think it's, it's very early. It's about Exodus, Exodus 3, I think. He comes to the burning bush, and there is an, if you read the, the account, it's an angel in the bush, in the burning bush. An angel is there, and an angel begins to speak. But then a couple of verses later, it shifts, the language shifts, and it says, God said to Moses. So perfect, so perfectly in harmony are the holy angels with God's will, that even in Scripture, sometimes it's difficult to say, is it a, 
Is it God acting directly or an angel acting directly through the Just how is it working? This is a matter of great consolation to us in this veil of tears because we all have angels assigned to us by God who simultaneously, as they are with us, see the face of God. They know what God's will is for us. And we can ask our angels and talk to them. Angels are persons, like we are, supernatural. They transcend us by orders of magnitude. But we can talk to them, and we can ask them to help us and guide us and protect us. Now, the word Michael means who is like God. Now, we might use this today and perhaps for the rest of the week as a point of reflection. Who is like God? Well, it's true that we human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. But when we turn the question really like a mirror and face it towards ourselves and we say, who is like God? We are not like God. We are not like the angels. We are like ourselves in our humanity. And this humanity was taken by the Son of God into an indestructible bond with his divinity and now sits at the right hand of God a place where no angel could ever possibly sit. You can receive Holy Communion. An angel, no matter how mighty or great, cannot. You can receive absolution for your sins. Fallen angels can't. They are forever locked in to whatever state they're in now. Angels cannot change their minds. You will experience the resurrection of the flesh. Angels will know nothing of this. They will marvel and rejoice when we rise from the dead. God gives missions to angels to perform. God gives us missions to perform as well. Now, angels will always succeed. But as the angelic Teresa of Calcutta said, God doesn't ask that we succeed in everything. He only asks that we be faithful. So ask your angels to help you. Always to be faithful, to, to know better and more clearly the will of God. Ask them to protect you, to help you. And I would ask you, if you would be so kind, as to ask the holy angels to protect me in the next uh, few days. I uh, leave today for Rome, and I'll be in Rome for about a month. And I will pray for all of you at those beautiful altars and those lovely churches. I'll remember all of you, and I'd ask that you keep me in your prayers, and ask the holy angels to protect me and all who travel from any spiritual and temporal harm. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.